from many conversations and listener feedback over the years with loyal listeners, I have gathered that despite my podcast, despite me trying to explain what precious metals royalty and streaming companies are, a lot of people still don't understand what they are. Maybe they don't take the time to look at the companies and their business plan. Maybe they just assume that the management team is lying. But I want to set the record straight here, and I'll do it through this mining stock education lecture, even though Precious Metals Royalty and Streaming Companies are not, are not mining companies, although they are very similar to mining stock ETFs. In some ways, they are far better. And you have seen this with the shares of Sandstorm Gold and others that have outperformed in the last 12 months both the price of gold and many mining stock ETFs. So first off, Precious Metals Royalty and Streaming Companies, they are high profit margin, high sales turnover businesses that focus on diversifying cash flow, at least the larger ones. The smaller ones are different. I don't personally, I don't like any of the ones that are smaller than Mavericks Metals. Any of those smaller ones, they have little or no cash flow. They have at most one to three tiny little assets of cash flow. They overpay on almost every single deal. They overpay for bad valuation, and in order to grow, they do massive amounts of share dilution that they say is, is shareholder creative, but I don't believe it. Their valuations are too high for stocks, although if there is a gold price mania and the gold price does go higher, they will go higher. But underlying the operational businesses, I do not think they're good businesses, the smaller royalty and streaming companies, because you have to, have, you have to be large enough to have diversified cash flow to stop share dilution. So you don't have to screw up the balance sheet. And on top of that, with the smaller royalty and streaming companies, and Sandstorm Gold had this years ago, there's growing pains where a deal can go bad and their share dilution, shareholders get grumpy. And on top of this, with the smaller companies, management teams, from what I've seen with the smaller royalty and streaming companies, management team overpays themselves. And they also have a lot of hidden buyout provision clauses where all of their stock options at ridiculously high share prices have to get bought out. So the management teams, once those small little royalty and streaming companies get bought, those management teams are going to make many millions of dollars extra that their shareholders will not benefit from. So before I talk about case studies with royalty and streaming companies and why they are the superior business model, why they can adapt their business model and the deals they do in different cycles, in different um, price environments for gold, different parts of the cycle, bear market cycle, sideways, and bull market. Let me just talk about it a brief history then of royalty and streaming companies. So royalties, mining companies have owned royalties for a very long time. Normally the mining companies would drill off a property and if they didn't want to build the property or they didn't think it had much to it, they would sell the property, maybe keep a royalty or they would sell the royalty to someone else or the geologist who was working for the miner or a private individual geologist, maybe a team of geologists that had done some of the exploration work, they would just hold on to a royalty just in case. So there's always been royalties. However, until Franco Nevada in the 1970s, there was not a company that was trying to build a royalty company. And Franco Nevada bet initially, there's articles on this from Sprott, there's interviews with Pierre Lassonde, him and his business partner, they basically had to bet almost all their savings and almost all their shareholder capital on one or two deals. And they got lucky because number one, the gold price was rising. And number two, there was enormous exploration success at one of the royalties they bought. And the mine has been producing for over 40 years, throwing off cash flow. I believe Franco Nevada in that portfolio, that royalty has still been cash flowing for over 40 years, despite the original mine plan only being about 10 or 12 years. So the mine found a lot more resource and reserves with exploration drilling. And this is where the royalty and streaming company benefits because the mining companies themselves, a mining company can benefit once it, the mine is built. And normally the mine only has about a 10 year mine plan initially because the miners don't want it when they're building the mine and they've drilled off the mine enough for a reserve to raise the money to construct a mine and build a mine. They don't want to waste too much money on exploration drilling because they already have 10 years of reserves. The business plan is after that to go and take the operating cash flow from the mine after it's producing and generating cash flow, hopefully with free cash flow and at a good margin and reinvest that into exploration drilling. And normally with a lot of mines, not every mine, but a lot of mines initially, 
because the mine is underexplored around the mine, they tend to find at least double the resource and reserves. Um, Nolan Watson talked about a study on this on his last interview with me. He did extensive research into this before he raised the money for Sandstorm Gold. So the royalty and streaming companies don't have to pay for that exploration drilling. They ride along as partners for free. And this business model allows you to generate diversified free cash flow, but you have to get to the size of a Sandstorm Gold or an Cisco Gold royalty first. You have to have a certain amount of diversified cash flow first before you can really optimize the business model. And as you can see in the slide, you're generating just enormous amounts of efficient cash flow compared to the other mining companies. So if the gold price goes high enough or the copper price goes high enough, those mining companies shares will go up a lot. However, their margins might not be maintained. So we saw this when the gold price and the silver price were going crazy in 2010 and part of 2011. So when gold got up to 1900, the mining company, the primary gold miners, they did not maintain their margin. So even though the share prices went up a lot and I made some gains on speculation and I sold out a lot of my gold mining shares towards the top and I profited enormous hundreds of percent returns on a lot of my shares in a couple year period, the, mine, the underlying earnings announcements, revenue announcements and margins for the primary gold and primary silver miners when gold and silver prices were going crazy were not what you thought they should be. They were not generating insane amounts of free cash flow. And that's because the miners, their costs were rising in, in an enormous amount. Um, all their costs, like oil price was going up, cost of labor, cost of, I believe Steve St. Angelo covered this, like the cost of the large Caterpillar earth mover trucks, each tire replacement, and these things have to run all the time. The tire cost went from like $5,000 per tire on one of these trucks, and there's a lot of trucks, and at one point it was $40,000 per tire. So that's an enormous increase. There was a lot of expenses like this. Um, you had all these mining unions and miners demanding higher wages with the higher metals prices. So all these things were going up. On top of this, the mining companies themselves were throwing in very uneconomic ore because they could. So they had been stockpiling uneconomic ore, very marginal ore, and waiting for a higher price and it stockpiled. And then they don't mine that ore or they blend it when metals prices are at certain levels. So as part of the business plan, the miners will blend certain types of ore. They will normally blend to keep a mine economic for a longer period of time, their best ore with their marginal ore. And if metals prices go high enough, the garbage ore with very little gold or silver in it or copper in it gets mined then and processed in the mill. Okay, so the royalty and streaming companies don't have to worry about this. Franco Nevada has gross margins above 80%. This is a high profit margin, high turnover business model that is in the Buffettology book, which puts all businesses into four categories. The precious metals royalty and streaming companies are the rare high profit, high margin business, which normally is not on sale on a public exchange. And these businesses have won awards for efficiency. Besides the slide I have, and if you're not paying attention to the slide, I'll just I'll just summarize it for you. Basically, Royal Gold only has 23 total employees, and Royal Gold has 43 sources of diversified cash flow. Their market cap is let me pull it up real quick. Their market cap is 6.71 billion. So they're at a 52 week high, but in 2016, the stock dropped down. If you were smart, it was at $27.28 per share on January 25th, 2016. So that would have been the time to buy it. You could add over a three bagger by now, if you would have been patient and bought when there was blood on the streets. So the business model, besides that, the other thing about the business model, once there's enough sources of diversified cash flow, and so the revenue per employee you're getting diversified cash flow. So if one mine goes bad or a deal goes bad, the company does not go bankrupt. We've seen this lately with, in the last couple of years, with the Cisco Gold Royalty symbol OR, Oscar Robertson, like the Hall of Fame basketball player. Those shares were at like $17 per share a couple of years ago, and the stock is down to 10. Well, I think that this is not financial advice, just my opinion. I think the stock's a bargain. 
okay, because they have a couple really good royalties from very good mines generating cash flow. And even if management screws things up badly at some point, and this is just speculation on my part, but I know Franco Nevada is out there looking for deals, looking for growth because they're big. They've increased their dividend 11 years in a row since re IPOing. And at some point, if Osisco Gold Royalty continues to screw up with the deals, even their underlying assets that are still generating cash flow, cash flow, and I think they're making over $100 million per year in cash flow, that at some point, Franco Nevada will just come in and pay a premium because their assets, their cash flow assets are that attractive. Even though management for the last couple of years has had some mistakes, some big ones, and has had to write stuff off, that these businesses do not go bankrupt unless management is very, very dumb for a very, very long period of time. There's a lot of asset write downs and, and or the management over leverages the balance sheet with debt. As long as that does not happen and the company is scaled enough with diversified cash flow at the Sandstorm Gold level or larger, so the other four companies that are larger than Sandstorm, the companies will not go bankrupt. Okay, because there's, the assets are just too attractive. At some point, we could see just enormous amounts of private equity money just maybe come in here and drastically overpay for these things as the uh, gold bull market starts to really get ripping. So let me talk now about, let me continue about the history of royalty and streaming companies. I got a little off tangent there because I'm mixing in case studies with history. So Franco Nevada bet the whole company in a couple royalties. They did very, very well. And then Newmont Mining bought Franco Nevada. Franco Nevada then was given a lot of royalties by Newmont Mining. So I think Pierre Lassonde ran after Franco Nevada was acquired. Pierre Lassonde then ran Newmont Mining and then Newmont Mining got all these extra royalties, uh, excuse me, um, Franco Nevada got all these extra royalties from Newmont Mining, and Franco Nevada has 106 royalties and streams now that are cash flowing, just enormous amount. They also have, I think, another 300 royalties and streams in their pipeline of growth that are not cash flowing. So there's a lot of growth in there, a lot of which is already paid for, and that's the key, because if it's already paid for, there's no surprise capex bombs like with some of these miners where all of a sudden with a miner there's a couple hundred million or a billion dollars in capex at a mine that the miner can't afford so frank on all these royalty and streaming companies larger than sandstorm gold they were all basically not built from scratch Franco was built from scratch for a short amount of time, and then they were bought out, and then they were given all these royalties by Newmont Mining, and then they were spun out as an IPO, I think in 2007. And Franco Nevada was then, they've had 11 straight years of dividend increases, and it's just a, a superb company. Despite the gold price doing nothing, Franco Nevada shares are up a lot. 11 straight years of dividend increases, a lot of diversified cash flow. Same thing with Royal Gold. Royal Gold was also a spinoff. I forget which mining company. And Silver Whedon, now Whedon Precious Metals, they were a spinoff of Whedon River Gold and Gold Corp. So those were royalties that those miners held. They put them in there. And then Nolan Watson, and he's basically the most genius, innovative person in the in the streaming space. Now, there, like I said, there's been royalty deals done for a long time. And royalties, if a mining company goes bankrupt, royalties do not get discharged. Royalties stay with the royalty and streaming company even through a bankruptcy. They're tied to the land. So even if a mining company sells a mine or the mining company goes bankrupt and then another miner buys it out of bankruptcy, the royalty is not discharged. The royalty stays on the land, okay? At least in most jurisdictions, I think. There might be a couple exceptions, but they're not really worth mentioning right now. So, uh, Nolan Watson got hired. He was considered like this genius young investment banker, very smart, gold medal award account, uh, gold medal award accountant, and he came up with the business model of starting to do silver streaming deals. And so they went to with Silver Wheaton. They went to these base metal miners and gold miners that had silver byproduct, and they started buying up all these deals for silver streams. And it was pretty genius at the time because they were buying the difference between a royalty and a stream is the silver stream, you make more of an upfront payment. And whereas with a royalty, you're getting the royalties can be anywhere normally between like 0.25% of the revenue of the mine and 5% of the mine of the annual revenues of the mine. And 
any exploration upside, you also benefit from the royalties. But the stream, a stream what is different is you make a giant upfront cash payment. Normally if the miner needs to build a mine or the miner has a bad balance sheet and needs the cash to pay off debt and, and recapitalize their balance sheet. And the stream, what the stream does then is the, royal, the royalty and streaming company that buys the stream, they have the right to purchase the gold or the silver in the stream or copper stream. There's a few base metal uh, streaming companies, but like Altius Minerals and a couple others. But this is just precious metals uh, streaming that I want to talk about. And so they might have the right to purchase all gold at either 20% or 30% of spot price or at a fixed price. So maybe it's the initial gold stream, some of them were pretty onerous to the miners, but those stream contracts can be amended. So unlike the banks, which have very onerous terms on debt, and the banks are very inflexible with debt terms and debt covenants, things can go really bad very quickly. So basically, once you're in breach of a debt covenant, if you're a mining company, the banks could either A, call in your loans, which they tend to not do immediately, but B, they can try to force you to start selling your assets very quickly. So that could happen. But with these streaming contracts, these things are flexible. And this is the key to the royalty and streaming companies is if a royalty or stream if a excuse me if a stream becomes not financially good to a lot of the miners they can amend the contract and you've seen a lot of these deals amended you saw that with silver Wheaton. they did one for first majestic silver on the san dimas mine there was an agreement reached so first majestic silver could make more money when they bought the san dimas mine from primero there's a there's a lot of these there's a lot of wiggle room royal gold did an amendment i think on mount milligan for the gold stream there there was an amendment there so it's a lot more viable uh it's a lot more flexible franco nevada did an amendment to uh Coeur d'Alene's palmarejo mine they bought and these terms of these deals will not happen again franco nevada bought a, over a billion dollars worth of gold at palmarejo 50 percent life of mine including all exploration upside for 30 years of mine life they bought it for only 80 million in cash because Coeur d'Alene was bringing the mine online at the wrong time in 2008 and 9 they were constructing the mine and the mine was not on time and not on budget and Coeur d'Alene needed that cash flow they needed the mine to make a profit to pay off their loans and they were in deep deep trouble close to bankruptcy so Franco Nevada came in gave them cash and the silver streams were the first streaming contract Silver Wheaton did a lot of them Franco Nevada I think did some but Nolan Watson has been doing the innovation in the industry with the with the Silver Stream contract, and then he left Silver Wheaton to start Sandstorm Gold, and he was the first to do the Gold Streaming contract. That was initially on junior on junior producers, junior gold producers, and it was very risky. And then what happens is after people saw that Sandstorm Gold was successfully doing these contracts, you saw all the larger companies like Franco Nevada, Royal Gold, start to copy sandstorm gold and do larger gold streaming contracts with the miners like base metal miners that had gold byproduct etc or gold miners that had silver byproduct stuff like that and this business model you can you can leverage up the balance sheet temporarily you pay off your debt and you can just keep growing diversified cash flow and that's why it's good and it's adaptable so in different market conditions there's deals available to either if if it's a bear market or a sideways market these larger royalty and streaming companies are going to do deals to repair miners balance sheets help give them cash or they're going to do deals to maybe help them bring on a new mine if there's a really new economic mine like London gold or something like that their fruta del norte mine and that's especially true if the gold price goes high and the silver price goes high so people the people who are saying royalty and streaming companies are bad i don't like the business model the miners are going to outperform them if gold and silver continue to go higher, you will see the royalty and streaming companies adapt their business model to start doing new funding deals to bring new mines online. And they may even split the cost because the banks are not doing this anymore, especially the Canadian banks. A lot of the large Canadian investment banks have either drastically reduced their um, mining divisions or they've removed them entirely and a lot of the small and medium-sized investment banks or merchant banks that used to do financing for a lot of these mid-tier miners and juniors they've won out of business in the last eight to ten years 
So the royalty and streaming companies are filling the void. The other thing I really like about the royalty and streaming companies, besides how they can diversify cash flows faster than a mining company, and look on that slide there, the mining companies have to have enormous amounts of employees. They have to have a lot of moving parts. So many things can go wrong with the mine. If it's a large mine, they have to almost gamble the company on it. The royalty and streaming companies, you have 23 employees, you have 43 assets for Royal Gold generating cash flow. It's a very simple business model. They're not doing any rocket science except for the geologists that are finding exploration upside. The other slide, and I didn't, because I only have one slide here, but there's another slide on the Royal Gold Investors Presentation, slide five of their latest investors presentation for how efficient their business model is, and that's Royal Gold revenue per employee. It, uh, According to S&P Capital IQ that compiled the research, Royal Gold is, I believe, second. They're second out of all companies on the S&P 500 for revenue per employee at just under $20 million revenue per employee, $19.9 million per employee in 2018. Only this host hotels, it's very impressive. So it's a, that just says how efficient their business model is because they don't have to have a lot of overhead, which means that they can have strong margins, they can have focus on growth, they can focus on dividends, they can focus on diversifying cash flow, and they don't have to spend a lot of money on overhead and you know, waste, which is you know, hiring all these employees that they don't need, which it, for a lot of large companies, that's the case. Franco Nevada, I think, being like a 14 or, I think it's, no, it was 14 like a couple months ago last time I looked at it. I think it's like 16 or $17 billion now, and they have only about 40 employees. So they have enormous amounts of assets online generating cash flow, and they only have 40 employees. Okay, so back to the history of royalty and streaming companies. Sandstorm Gold was the only large royalty and streaming company out of the five largest ones for Franco Nevada, Royal Gold, Osisco Gold, Gold Royalty, Wheaton Precious Metals to be the only one built from scratch. So it's an impressive achievement. However, there was a lot of... There was a lot of growing pains. It was a lot of problems. Um, a lot of the initial deals, there was not immediate cash flow. So this is why I don't like the smaller companies because if the gold price doesn't and silver price doesn't keep going up a lot, the other companies are going to have to dilute like crazy. And then they're going to have to hope for a buyout, hope, hope for a premium. I got a question, I got a super chat yesterday for a dollar from a loyal listener asking about Sandstorm yesterday on the on the China show, and I didn't have a chance to answer because I didn't think it was appropriate on that show. But on this show, I'll answer, and he was asking, because it fits in with this lecture, he was asking about exploration success from one of Sandstorm Gold's partners, which is Endeavor Mining and their Hyundai mine and their carry pump discovery. So Sandstorm Gold has bought um, a very large land package when they acquired the royalty for Hyundai, which is on Endeavor Mines, mine in Africa, I think two and a half years ago, approximately. And they paid like 40 or $50 million, something like that. And the mine is cash flowing more per year than was expected. But Sandstorm Gold had their two full-time geologists visit the site multiple times. And they were very optimistic about the exploration upside. They did their homework. And they thought the carry pump deposit the carry pump, at uh, well, when they bought the royalty, it was only being drilled, but they thought it could be another gold deposit. And we just got a press release this week that carry pump now added um, over 700,000 ounces of new resource to the discovery that's going to be milled at Hyundai. And Sandstorm Gold's um, royalty land package, it covers 80% of carry pump. So that's the type of exploration upside that you're going to get. It's not priced into the Sandstorm Gold stock, but... Sandstorm Gold shareholders ride along for free on that, that they're getting cash flow from this royalty. This royalty is already going to make a really good return just from the cash flow from the mine. But on top of that, we just got really good exploration upside news. And not only will those um, reserves that are mine being replaced, but these are going to be higher grade, maybe even more cash flow. So you can get with a royalty and streaming company, you're not taking the CapEx risks you're not taking some of the balance sheet problems, um, mining companies doing really bad deals at the top of the cycle, management teams um, grossly overpaying themselves and still not producing a profit. You're not taking those types of risks. Now, a mining stock ETF, like I said, is very similar to a royalty and streaming company. But in a lot of ways, I think a royalty and streaming company is more efficient. There's also a royalty and streaming company 
ETF, a stock ETF, that's GoAU. That's Frank Holmes' one. The U.S. Global Investors one, yeah, it's GoAU, like the periodic table symbol for gold. That's just under $14 now. That'll buy you a basket of royalty and streaming companies if you don't want to own any individual royalty and streaming companies. Hey, thanks, Science Spotter, for the super chat donation. I appreciate it. Yeah, so going going forward, the royalty and streaming companies, because they have good cash flow at these prices, because they have good margins, they'll just adapt to the market conditions far better than the miners can. They can be contrary. If metals prices don't go higher and they start to correct again with the paper's metals price manipulation, they can just adapt and do different types of deals. And if prices go higher, you will see the larger royalty and streaming companies. You may see if Osisio Gold Royalty lags. I think you would see either Weed and Precious Metals or Franco Nevada, probably Franco, attempt a buyout, maybe a hostile takeover. Because uh, Osisco has had some, some very bad write-offs the last couple of years. They've misallocated some capital. But underlying the business still has at least two or three really good royalties that are throwing off a ton of cash flow for them. So again, none of this is financial advice. I just want to sec set the record straight about royalties and streams. So the key, the key, the most efficient part of the business in getting to success is you have to get at least to the level of Sandstorm Gold or larger. Mavericks Metals is not there yet. Mavericks Metals has um, 25,000 gold equivalent ounces per year production. So they're on their way. However, the valuation on Mavericks Metals, it was over $400 million last time I looked. I don't think, I don't think the valuation is that good. It could go a lot higher, but I don't think the valuation is nearly as attractive as going out and buying shares of Again, not financial advice, just my opinion. Buying shares of Weed and Precious Metals now, buying shares of a Cisco Gold Royalty, or buying shares of Sandstorm Gold. And Sandstorm Gold's growth pipeline, and this is a key for a lot of these royalty and streaming companies. Franco Nevada has 300 assets in their growth pipeline that are already paid for with royalties. And yes, they're not enormous needle movers, but once the royalty and streaming company started doing gold streams, their net asset value grew enormously. Franco Nevada was only about a $2 billion company in 2009. So they've grown, despite the gold price not doing much, Franco Nevada has grown like seven, more than sevenfold. Despite the gold price doing nothing, Franco Nevada has grown revenues, grown earnings, grown free cash flow, increased dividends. And their market cap has grown more than sevenfold, despite the gold price in the last, since 2011, doing basically nothing. This is the highest gold price in six years. And it, you know what? For Franco Nevada, for their underlying business, to grow their business, it didn't matter. They still grew their business. They still were efficient. Shareholders got rewarded. That's my point. That's why the business model works. That's why there's more of these royalty and streaming companies. There's a lot of bad copycats that are small ones. People ask me about Rob McEwen. I respect Rob McEwen. I think he's a smart guy. However, he's been predicting gold prices for $10,000 or $5,000 or $10,000 every year for the last 10 years since I've been in the gold community. The other thing that, that, that pisses me off about Rob McEwen is that he talks relentless shit on royalty and streaming companies, but guess what? He's the largest shareholder for Abitibi Royalty, okay? Which, which owns a royalty on one of Canada's largest gold mines, and he pays himself an enormous dividend, okay? So he says one thing about how bad royalty and streaming companies are and how they're going to do so poorly, and then he's pocketing dividend checks from being the largest share, shareholder of another from a company that owns a very good royalty but doesn't focus on growth. That, excuse me, that doesn't focus on growth. So I consider that pretty hypocritical behavior and a double standard. Noah wants to, Turquoise Hill Resources is not a royalty and streaming company. They have a good, obviously a good project in Mongolia, but there's delays at that mine and they've taken on a lot of debt to build that mine. So the buyout, if there is one, might not be at a premium. I think Nolan Watson said on a podcast that they're selling for a 0 0.2 times NAV. So they're selling at a, a fraction of the net asset value multiple. I think he's personally buying shares. Um, the there's a podcast you can search for it. It was on the Sandstorm Gold Twitter feed from about a month ago. 
So the history of royalty and streaming companies, I think I cover that pretty well, that Sandstorm Gold is the only one built from scratch, and it took many years to get rid of the growing pains and to get up to that level where you have 20-something assets online now generating diversified cash flow. And for exploration upside, let's talk about the stream, um, not stream, the royalty that Sandstorm Gold bought on the Fruta del Norte gold mine from Lundin Gold. So they paid like $32 million approximately for that royalty, which by the way should have sold for probably double that at least. And they're going to make good a decent amount of cash flow per year i think it's going to start off three million dollars per year and then it might ramp up to five but the real key is the land package it is a massive land package around the mine that has not been drilled yet so you could be looking at massive increases five to seven years from now of cash flow from that royalty on top of that you could be looking at that mine potentially running if they drill it off and things go well with the exploration upside you could be looking at that mine running for 20 30 40 years even longer so the mine plan's only for 10 or 11 years. But remember what I said, that the mining companies normally get to about 10 years of resource or uh, 10 years of reserve and some resource, and then they stop drilling and they wait until the mine's built and then use the operating cash flow for exploration. So the royalty and streaming companies, when they do a stream streaming deal or a royalty deal, they benefit from all this and they don't have to put CapEx in. The mining companies have to put CapEx in to replace reserves and exploration. The royalty and streaming companies benefit from this. They ride along for free and they don't have to put CapEx in. And that's if you build a diversified portfolio of these assets right, that's how you win. That's how management team wins. That's how shareholders win. And once the company gets large enough, if a couple deals go bad, the company doesn't risk any bankruptcy. What just happens is what's happening with those Cisco Gold Royalty where the shares are down from 17 down to 10, despite, um, I think, hundreds of millions of dollars of asset write-offs. And I think worst case scenario for a Cisco Gold Royalty for people who are worried about it is probably a buyout, like I said. If they lag for another year or two, they'll definitely get bought. Uh, excuse me, high probability, no, not financial advice. I have to put all these stupid disclaimers in now. I'll put my money where my mouth is. If I had more money coming in, I would definitely be buying Osisco Gold Royalty shares too. Just because they have some really good royalties that are generating cash flow despite what management has done the last couple of years. But they were a spinoff. So they had um, Osisco Mining and they had their gold mine being built and then they kept a royalty, a 5% royalty on the gold mine and they were a spinoff. So they were not built from scratch. The only royalty and streaming company that's large that was built from scratch was Sandstorm Gold. And Nolan Watson is the father of Silver Streams and Gold Streams. Let me check my notes and make sure I mentioned everything. Yeah, so what I love about royalty and streaming companies, especially the larger ones, is... First of all, they, they don't go on sale that much. So you're normally paying a higher valuation for them. They're not normally super cheap and on sale except for Sandstorm Gold. And Sandstorm Gold now, the shares have gone up a lot because they've been um, doing the share buyback and they just had two big assets online generating cash flow, two new ones. But they can adapt their business model. That is very important. They can change the types of deals they do. So they do not have to take the risks that a mining company might. A small or medium-sized miner might have to bet the whole company on one mine. A royalty and streaming company, if they have a portfolio of diversified assets generating cash flow, similar to a gold mining ETF, they do not have to do this. Turquoise Hill Resources, it really depends on Chinese copper demand. So if you think Chinese copper demand is still going to grow, and if you think the copper price will rebound, it is a most likely Turquoise Hill, this is not financial advice, just my opinion. Most likely Turquoise Hill will get bought. Most likely Entree Gold will get bought. Sandstorm Gold announced in their press release yesterday that, or yesterday or the day before that um, they bought a ton more shares of Entree Gold too, which is right next to Turquoise Hill. The Entree Gold portion of the Oyu Tolgoi deposit in Mongolia, which actually has, um, which is Haruga. It's the underground part next to Yugo North, Yugo North Lift. The Haruga portion, which Entree Gold owns, is actually the highest grade for copper, gold, and silver. However, it is years away from mining. So they have been having some problems. They $5 billion in CapEx, I believe, already was invested into the underground portion of OT. But, you know, until the mine is generating good, solid cash flow and margins, those, those shares are not going to do too well. 
the only thing I would be worried about is that the buyout premium is not going to be good. Again, not financial advice, just my opinion. But maybe Nolan, Nolan Watson and those guys are on the board of directors for Entree Gold, so maybe they know something I don't. And since they're on the board of directors for Entree Gold, they're allowed to know that. <laughs> so that's why these, these businesses, mining stocks may outperform temporarily the royalty and streaming companies, but it is there is no debate that royalty and streaming companies overall are far better businesses. Okay, shareholders for Franco Nevada have done superbly despite the gold price not doing much. Okay, there's share and Franco Nevada is the model. Wheaton Precious Metals has had some problems with over leveraging the balance sheet with debt, some bad deals that they've had to write off in the past and in the, the Canadian Tax Authority, which just got resolved. But Franco Nevada is literally the gold standard, and it's outperformed pretty much every other gold stock for many years except for Kirkland Lake. Uh, I don't go by price to earnings. I don't go by price to earnings. It's on an operating cash flow multiple, and they're growing very rapidly. Okay, JB Wentworth says, during a crisis run-up, would royalty companies keep pace with an ETF like GLD? I wouldn't want, first of all, JB Wentworth, I wouldn't want to own an ETF like GLD. Why do you want to own GLD? GLD isn't even real gold. Do you, do you just want exposure to gold? If you want exposure to gold, there's other gold ETFs that are better, like the Sprott, the CEF, Sprott. The one that they bought for from Central Fund of Canada, they bought them out. There's a Sprott Physical Gold Trust. There's a Sprott Physical Silver Trust. Why do you want to own GLD? Because it's liquid. There's They probably don't even have the gold. Their prospectus has so many legal loopholes. Sandstorm Gold will eventually pay a dividend, but they're focused on growth now, probably in a few years. And um, 7.82, if you're looking at price-to-earnings ratio, it may be misleading because a lot of companies that are publicly traded on the S&P 500, their, their price-to-earnings ratios looks cheap or average. Meanwhile, that they've loaded their balance sheet with debt and there's no revenue growth. So the price-to-sales ratio may actually be double. Sandstorm Gold is growing rapidly and the market is rewarding it. They have a lot of assets coming online over the next five to seven years that are going to generate them massive increases in cash flow. And also the market is pricing in what you don't understand, 782, because they're a growth stock. The market is pricing in that Sandstorm Gold could get bought. The market is already pricing in that there, there could be a buyout. That's why the market is excited too. There's a lot of people that think Sandstorm Gold will be bought in the next few years. Okay, well, that's it for this short show. There's other things I could discuss, but I just wanted to give you guys an overview of the industry about royalties and about streams. Royalties are actually safer than streams because they're tied to the land and the royalties don't get discharged in bankruptcy, but streams can be renegotiated or amended, the streaming contract. So you have a situation where Royal Gold or Franco Nevada can amend a stream. Sandstorm Gold has amended a stream to royalty on the Arizona mine, um, which was Sandstorm Gold's first gold stream back with Luna Gold before it changed to like True Gold and Equinox Gold. There's been some name changes on it, but Sandstorm Gold changed the gold stream to a royalty, a sliding scale royalty, and the royalty was 3% NSR. So Sandstorm Gold is making $5 million per year in annual cash flow on the Arizona royalty from Equinox Gold now has an enormous amount of exploration upside. So if Equinox Gold announces a big mine extension at the Arizona mine in Brazil, Sandstorm Gold will benefit for free. So if the mine runs with the underground portion, either the open pit gets extended on the mine life for another 10 years or 20 years, or there's an underground mine, Sandstorm Gold's royalty is attached to the land package. They're they don't have to contribute in any any additional capital, and that royalty could be running for another 20, 30 years. And the other thing about the sliding scale royalty is if the gold price goes to 1500 that royalty will change from a 3% NSR to a 4% NSR. And that doesn't sound significant, but then you get the cash flow actually would double. So it would go from $5 million per year up to $10 million per year. Nolan Watson said that in his last interview with me 
a couple months ago in April. Yeah, Royal Gold's expensive now, Alan. Um, Royal Gold's expensive now, Alan. They've they've doubled, I think, in the last like. Let me here look at the chart. Yeah, they've doubled since. They've doubled since uh, March 24th of 2016 when it was at 50. So, but you have to pick out the time to buy these things. But my point by using Royal Gold is not that it's a good stock to buy right now or that it's cheap necessarily, but that it, the underlying business is a good business, okay? They have diversified cash flow, 43 assets online generating cash flow. They pay dividends. They focus on sharehold, being efficient with their capital for shareholders. If they have a bad deal, they write it off. The company doesn't go bankrupt. They don't have to gamble the whole company away on a mine like a mining company does. Seven, if you're just looking at valuation, I would I would take a look at Osisco Gold Royalty. I think they're very cheap because it was $17 a share and they're still down to 10. And I think they're a buyout candidate in the next one to two years if the company continues to lag. They have very attractive royalties online generating cash flow if management team continues to screw this up. And uh, Weed Precious Metals, I think, is pretty cheap now. And Sandstorm Gold has, they're not as cheap as they were a year ago, but they're still pretty cheap. So if there are, this is not financial advice, but if I had more money coming in and there was like a 20% correction in Sandstorm Gold, I would continue accumulating shares. Okay, guys, well, that's it for today. I just wanted to do this short lecture on royalty and streaming companies, the history of them, what's a royalty, what's a stream. I can attach links to uh, the websites like on Franco Nevada explaining this in more detail. But the bottom line is it takes years normally unless the company, the royalty and streaming company is spun out from a producing miner, a larger one. It takes years f to build a diversified portfolio of assets, online generating cash flow. It's taken Sandstorm Gold a decade to get to these levels, to have 20-something assets online generating cash flow and have an enormous portfolio of growth. The other companies that are larger than Sandstorm were all spinoffs, where they had a couple really large royalties already making a lot of money. It was easier for them to do it. But these are good businesses, especially once they have a, a basket of these assets online generating cash flow. And if the management team screws up and does some bad deals, the company doesn't go bankrupt. The, comp the shares normally just are cheap. And the industry will probably consolidate, but I don't think the larger, uh, excuse me, I don't think the smaller royalty and streaming companies will necessarily be bought out at enormous premiums. They could be, but I don't think so. They may, if gold and silver prices go high enough, they will go up a lot, the smaller little ones, but the valuations they're at now are not good. And their business models, they're diluting like crazy and the management teams are have enormous buyout provisions. Okay, guys, bye for now.